mal einer der fast witzigsten Twitter Tweets. One of the almost funniest Twitter Tweets when my resignation was announced was If Ms. Garrow had been a man, she would have been accused of me too. If she hadn't been accused of me too, she would have been accused of sexual abuse. I found this funny because it clearly shows that when nothing else comes to mind, plagiarism must serve as the last bogeyman, which of course is only a reproach in the intellectual or academic sphere. Hello and herzlich willkommen auf Neutrality Studies. Hello and welcome to Neutrality Studies. Today, once again, with a contribution in German, as I am speaking with Dr. Ulrike Gero, one of the most renowned political scientists in Germany. Dr. Gero is the founder and co-director of the European Democracy Lab. She has been a professor at the University for Continuing Education Krems since 2016 and was a professor of European politics at the University of Bonn from 2021 to 2023, until she was dismissed last year due to allegations of plagiarism. Dr. Gero was also a critic of the government's COVID measures. At that time, she publicly presented important analyses of the societal situation, including on the channel of the philosopher Gunnar Kaiser, who passed away much too early. When the Ukraine war broke out, she was one of the first signatories of the Manifesto for Peace by Sahara Wagenknecht and Alice Schwarzer. She has also repeatedly spoken out in the German media for an immediate diplomatic solution to the war. For her realism-based analysis, she was then harshly criticized. Personally, I consider Dr. Gero to be one of the greatest German thinkers of our time. Therefore, it is a distinct honor for me to be able to speak with her today. Dr. Gero, welcome. Hello, I am really very pleased. Thank you very much. Thank you. And perhaps we should start right away with these unspeakable plagiarism accusations. Ms. Gero, how are you? What are you being accused of? And where do you stand today? Today is March 18th, the day we are speaking. Yes, first of all, thank you for the question, allowing me to elaborate on this. How am I doing? We are now entering spring, and even in Berlin, the sun is slowly starting to shine again. That's quite nice. I am, let's say, a bit tired of waiting. I was laid off last February, that's over a year ago now, and for many reasons, the court date has been postponed five times, so from September to October to January to February, now to April. And when you're hanging in limbo for 14 months, not really knowing what's coming next, and depending a lot on the outcome of such a court case for me, both in terms of hopefully rehabilitation and, of course, any financial settlements, then waiting 14 months is a long time. So in that sense, I feel fine, but I will also be glad when it's finally over on April 24th, the proceedings before the labor court in Bonn. Regarding the Gero case, I might just show this to the camera. The Gero case, attempt of a public execution. I want to emphasize this is not my book. I didn't write the book, nor did I initiate it. It was published by Gabriella Gisi. The book contains three contributions for those who want to read up on it. It is a short book, so one can read through it in about an hour and a half. The first contribution is from two sociologists, Ms. Egner and Ms. Uhlenwinkel, who have conducted an empirical study on dismissals from German universities since 2020 and have concluded that at the professorial level, we're not talking about mid-level staff. 25 professors have ultimately been removed from office, resigned, or left for flimsy reasons. This does not include, let's say, the mid-level staff who often have fixed-term contracts and then simply are not renewed. Then it's not a dismissal, yes, but still people leave. That's not even included. This means, first of all, this volume classifies, and I place great importance on the fact that I am not an isolated case, but that we can observe that there are obviously dismissals from German universities for other motives. The second article deals with plagiarism. It is not by Christoph Löwen. He analyzes my mistakes, so to speak, quite harshly, comes to the conclusion that they are trivialities. 
comes to the conclusion that they are, and I apologize for this sloppiness. So, for example, indirect speech without quotation marks, meaning that one says, the author so-and-so writes in his book so-and-so, comma, this, and then the quotation marks are missing. Now, one can argue whether indirect speech needs quotation marks or not. Anyway, what I want to say, no matter how Mr. Lova argues or analyzes, these are actually trivialities. I would like to add, the incriminated uh, books in question, I wrote each of them in three weeks. That's not a lot of time. There's not that much editing anymore. So I have already publicly apologized for the fact that in these non-scientific books, and that's also important, so they are not scientific qualification works, that there are negligences. But to mention a dimension, if one wanted to express this in percentage terms, so the number of words to the volume of the book, these negligences are in the range of 0.98 to 2 percent. So in principle, one could consider this within the error tolerance. For comparison, the European Court of Justice or the European Court of Auditors has now pointed out that in the awarding of public EU funds, where millions are awarded, there is an error rate of 4.5 percent, and for that, no commission official leaves his job. So just to clarify the dimension, and for these really minor issues, of course, I was not confirmed. So that was the pretext. This plagiarism accusation was the, I say pretext, yes, or was the reason for the termination. Ich sage Vorwand, ja, oder war der Grund für die Kündigung. Und deswegen habe ich Kündigungsschutzklage erhoben, weil ich eben denke... And that's why I filed a wrongful termination lawsuit, because I think that these mistakes fall within a margin of error, that they were not scientific books, and that, let's say, a reprimand might have sufficed, but not a termination, especially a termination without prior consultation with me, to warn or even to inform me. The third contribution in the volume, again, is by Roberto de la Puente. He is an author who tries to chronologically trace the whole event. So, when did I say what in public, either about the corona measures or about the war in Ukraine? When were the plagiarism allegations raised? Who raised them? What is the relationship between the people who raised the allegations and me? And he traces this, and if you trace it, then you can come to interesting conclusions. So, of course, there is a temporal coincidence between the times when I expressed criticism about Corona, about Ukraine, and then afterwards the plagiarism allegations came. These are old books. So a book from 2016, which was also submitted to the university for review at the time of my hiring, could have had the errors found in 2016 or at the time of my hiring. But they were found after I had spoken out publicly. You see, that's the temporal connection that Roberto de la Puente draws here and also names certain actors who are always the same actors die auch immer die gleichen Akteure sind, benennt. Ja, also es geht ganz konkret um die Rolle der FAZ. It specifically concerns the role of the FAZ. It specifically concerns the role of a political scientist from Trier, from whom all three accusatory articles originate, and one can read all about it and then form one's own opinion. Therefore, I am grateful that this book exists, because it is well-researched by three authors, and I am actually pleased that the book has received quite a bit of attention by now. I was told by the publisher that there are now somehow about 3,000 copies sold. That is actually already a considerable number of sales. Moreover, the book includes documentation. There were a total of 186 hate articles about me. So hate and agitation, controversial professor, controversial professor. And just to say briefly, it hurts a lot when that happens. So it hurts a lot when so many articles are so massively from people who don't even know me personally, let alone call to hear my opinion. That would be good journalism, interviewing the affected person. Yes, none of that happened. So there was a flood of a total of 186 articles. Of those, 50 are documented in the book, so documented, which newspaper, when, where, and so on. And the book also documents the press release of the University of Bonn after the publication of my Endgame book. In October 2022, I wrote a book with Hauke Ritz about the Ukraine war, titled Endgame Europe, 
I place great importance on the fact that, for example, not a single error was found in this book. Not a single mistake, neither in content nor in form. And I wrote this book together with Hauke Ritz, and it is an essay, an essay. So we write at the beginning that it is an essay, to see things, to view the Ukrainian-Russian war differently, to judge it differently. We even quote Adorno, so at the beginning Adorno in his famous essay about the essay. Essay means attempt, which is just the attempt to adopt a different perspective, which is basically the foundation of a scientific discourse. Where do you look? From which perspective do you shine a spotlight on an event? That's what we tried. And 10 days after the book was published, the book was released on October 24, 2022. 10 days later, the university publicly distanced itself from me. In the statement of distancing, my name is not mentioned, not explicitly mentioned. But it was absolutely clear that I was meant, because in the aftermath, six international newspapers picked up on the university's distancing and then mentioned me. So it was obvious to everyone, even if the university didn't mention me, everyone knew I was meant. And the process is unusual in that I do not write books in the name of the university, but I write books, or in this case an essay, again a non-scientific book. I write these books as a committed citizen, as someone who wanted to engage in a debate. We deliberately wanted to shed light on the European aspect of this conflict, and as a professor of European politics, I wanted to allow myself that. And it is striking, perhaps, to conclude that this book obviously caused a lot of stir and also the university's distancing from me. And the termination followed afterwards. So it happened in February 2023, a few months later. It is also striking that in the summer of 2022, a colleague told me that the University of Bonn had run my books, which were then incriminated for plagiarism, through plagiarism software. And it was found that it was not much, as I just said, 0.98 to 2 percent. I shouldn't worry. A commission would have to be convened because of public pressure, and then I would get a reprimand, but I shouldn't worry. So that was in the summer of 2022, after the corona book, in which I criticized the measures. Then I write the Europe Endgame book, and then comes the termination. This is at least striking as a chronological sequence, because when the Plagiarism Commission was convened in December 2022, I thought this is exactly what I was told. Now this commission is convened, and then I would be reprimanded for a few sloppinesses, but instead, completely out of the blue, without any prior information, came the termination. And that really hit me, well, just hard. Now you have to help me briefly, because in Japan I use more or less the American system with tenure positions and contract positions. In Europe, in Germany, the system is somewhat different. But especially in Germany, employee protection is extremely strong under their labor law. So, for example, in Switzerland, you can dismiss any employee within three months, but that's not possible in Germany at all. Why is it then possible for a professor at a university where it is clear that professors deserve extra protection in society, precisely because of controversies? How does that work? So from a labor law perspective as well. Yes, that's why I filed a wrongful termination lawsuit. My lawyer is convinced that it was not lawful, and that's why I filed a wrongful termination lawsuit. So that's exactly the reason why I'm now waiting for a German court, which will hear the case on April 24th, to hopefully determine that this is not acceptable. I'll say this. I am not a civil servant. I was too old when I was appointed. So I was already in Austria before, but since I'm not Austrian, I couldn't become a civil servant there. And then I was employed in the public service. I was appointed to the University of Bonn at the age of 57. So I was employed in the public service. But now it's up to German labor law to decide to what extent that was illegal. And in that regard, I'm looking forward to this decision.
For example, there was no warning. Yes, there's a golden rule in German labor law, no termination without a warning. That's essentially the golden rule of labor law. And that's why I decided to have it reviewed. The university would, of course, never admit that this termination has anything to do with their public statements, but will now attribute everything to the plagiarism allegations. However, it must also be said that Germany has a tragic history with these plagiarism allegations. So they lost a president over plagiarism allegations. You have to help me for a moment. What was his name? President of the Republic. Yes, exactly. And in the end, two years later, it all came to nothing. So he was 100% cleared of these allegations. But by then he was no longer president because he had of course resigned due to these allegations. Does the system, in your opinion, have? Hat das System Ihrer Ansicht nach? Also erstmal lege ich großen Wert darauf, dass ich äh, mit nicht. So first of all, I place great importance on the fact that when I now speak about this case and try to do so soberly and so to speak objectively, it it is by no means my intention to badmouth the University of Bonn or the actors involved in any way. That's not what this is about. So I I really want to emphatically ask that I try, or also that the authors in this book have tried to contextualize the case. So essentially, I believe it's not really about me and my person and this plagiarism, but it's about a societal situation that has apparently arisen in the Federal Republic where conformity pressure, restriction of opinion corridors, and so on, have led to, in certain situations, for example, in the discussion about the corona measures or in the discussion about the Russian-Ukrainian war, extremely narrowing the corridors of opinion, and where a society apparently highly hypnotized or agitated no longer wanted to let other voices be heard. And I believe that is first and foremost a specific situation. We don't have corona every day, and we don't have a war every day. These are new situations. It seems to me as if an entire society somehow needs to find its balance. What is still allowed under these emergencies? Ja, was ist denn jetzt unter diesen Notständen? Was ist da noch erlaubt? Also das scheint mir so ein gesellschaftlicher Prozess zu sein. So this seems to me to be a societal process. That's how it was argued with corona as well. This is now a special circumstance, and therefore, and with war, it's a bit similar. So it's war now, and therefore. And so once again, it's not about speaking ill of anyone. I say this explicitly. So I think the University of Bonn is a great university. I'm glad I went there. And it might also be important to say I was supposed to lead an institute the Sandra Ernst Robert Curtius Institute, an institute for European studies. And it's also important for me to say that the website of this institute states that this institute has the task of rethinking Europe in the 21st century beyond the paradigmatic assumptions of the 20th century, Europe and its role in the world. And actually, I thought that my Endgame Europe essay was exactly that, namely an essay, an attempt to adopt different perspectives and to rethink Europe beyond the paradigmatic assumptions for the 21st century. So Europe in a multipolar world. Then come these massive reactions, which are not the university, it's important to say that, but the university itself was under pressure. So there was the student council, there were the young socialists, there was the student parliament. So above all, the students, obviously as young people, have helped. This makes one think again about why it is that especially young people who are in their creative critical phase, rethinking the world, doing things differently, why especially these young people have succumbed to the conformity pressure in both debates about Corona and Ukraine. So this is actually an interesting question for society. And in this situation, I am writing in this specific situation, it is important for me to say this because it's not about speaking ill of anyone. It's just about understanding the situation. In this situation, I am writing these two critical books. And an agitated public puts the University of Bonn under pressure. There were Twitter threads for weeks. Hashtag Uli Kigero must leave this university. This woman is damaging the reputation of the University of Bonn, and so on. Yes, and one can only imagine that a university administration really comes under pressure when they experience something like this, and that in such a situation, overreactions might occur. 
That one then considers, well, what do we do with this woman? You can imagine that well. Of course, the problematic part is that no conversation could take place anymore. So I was always ready to talk at any time, also towards the ASTA, the JUSOs, and so on. Also auch gegenüber dem ASTA, den JUSOs und so weiter. I have always said that we would prefer to discuss my books in the lecture hall. That would be the function of the university, to controversially discuss the books in the lecture hall. But it didn't turn out that way. That was a long way to answer your question, which is, if such a situation as described arises, it would be close to assume that something must be found to get rid of this person. And in this respect, most of the plagiarism accusations we now know in Germany against Annette Chavan or Zu Gutenberg or Christian Wolff or whatever occurred with people who for some reason became unpopular or undesirable. Yes, while other people about whom we also know that the books are, let's say, almost completely copied, like Annalena Baerbock, is a good example. There, obviously, this book she wrote before the elections is 90% plagiarism. Yes, but the person who is not undesirable is allowed, and the person who is undesirable is not. So, in essence, it should be examined whether double standards are being applied here. And I believe that can be affirmed if you look at the individual accusations. The second thing that would need to be examined, or what society would have to answer, in my opinion, is how we as a society actually want to deal with these self-proclaimed plagiarism hunters. Yes, because they partly get paid for it. They are really commissioned in part to check on people, to say, there is someone who is undesirable. Take another look to see if you can find a corpse in the basement, so to speak. And I really have nothing against exposing unfair behavior or legal violations in the Federal Republic. Nevertheless, this forced hunt for plagiarism seems to me to be a peculiarity of recent times, serving exactly this purpose. Namely, that basically self-appointed individuals are almost doing commissioned work to find arguments to push certain people out of the public sphere. And I think that society, really society, including the university, should discuss both questions. Namely, the first question, what do we do with these plagiarism hunters? How does society deal with it? Because one point is still important. You said it. The moment the allegations are made, the lives of those affected are over. And whether the plagiarism allegations are refuted two years later or not, the denial is of no interest. And that is also my problem, because the damage has already been done. I have been removed from the university for a year, and not just from the university, but actually also from public life. Without payment, without wage. Without payment, exactly. So I just didn't receive any salary from February to March last year. Imagine the personal shock of having your mortgage for the apartment, two children, and so on. And from February 16 to March 1, no salary comes in. Just nothing anymore. So if you're 57 years old and don't have a partner, you have to process that first. Most people always imagine that there's a husband who still earns money, or probably most people think that if you're in the media, you have a lot of money, or people imagine that everyone has inherited something anyway. No, I live on my income. Um, and to have no income from one day to the next is indeed a very existential crisis. So what these plagiarism hunters do, I want to address that again, they actually destroy livelihoods. And whether you are proven right afterwards or not, and whether these accusations are subsequently refuted, is actually secondary for the person affected. And to think about this in an open society, I consider important. I believe that's why the book also has the subtitle, Attempts at a Public Execution. Because the immediate attempt is apparently to destroy someone first. So, the task that we as intellectuals and as academics have is also to analyze what is currently happening in our societies because that is exactly what is so difficult. The beautiful thing, I am actually a historian, so I have written a historical dissertation. The beautiful thing about history 
is that you can look back calmly and with all serenity see what has happened, because the emotions are no longer boiling. In the here and now, everything is boiling. And then you have to try to break it down again. And at the moment, we are seeing a societal reversal of accusation and verdict taking place. This is not only in the academic context, in the academic, of course, as well. So your case is part of a whole litany of international cases. In eine ganze Litanei an internationalen Fällen. Also Frau Claudine Gay heißt sie ja in den USA. Genau. Claudine Gay, as she is known in the USA, was the president of Harvard. And she had to leave because in the end there were allegations of plagiarism after she had positioned herself positively towards the freedom of speech of her students on Palestine. And then she was quickly out of the picture. And we see this in other areas too. So the very large and very famous YouTuber Russell Brand was not confronted with plagiarism allegations, but rather he was accused of sexual harassment and his six million channel on YouTube was then immediately demonetized in the United Kingdom on the grounds that yes, if there are allegations, he shouldn't be able to earn anything at all. That's it, even though there was no charge yet. So here people are really being destroyed by social mechanisms who also expose themselves in public. Therefore, my question is, how should we as academics deal with the fact that we are actually supposed to express ourselves publicly, because that is also our mission, and because we also want to take it on if we then, like him now, face financial and personal ruin? How do you deal with this situation? So first of all, to address the allegations of sexual abuse, one of the almost funniest Twitter tweets when my resignation was announced was, if Ms. Garrow had been a man, she would have been accused of Me Too. If not Me Too, she would have been accused of sexual abuse. I found this funny because it clearly shows, when nothing else comes to mind, plagiarism has to serve as the last bogeyman, which of course is only an accusation in the intellectual or academic sphere. Most people outside do copy-paste. Whether your footnote is correct or not, the main thing is that the book is good, I say. By the way, to say it again, you can really accuse me of a lot, maybe of being sloppy. Yes. Still, I wrote books of 200, 300 pages on two different topics, Corona and Ukraine, in one year, and both were bestsellers. So one could also appreciate the intellectual, also creative achievement and say, yes, that's a good performance, and unfortunately there are a few mistakes, then I correct the mistakes, then it's okay. So that would be a bit like, the Bauhaus once said, form follows function. The form follows the content. While today in the academic sphere, we often experience the opposite. So, for example, during Corona, we experienced perfectly formed studies that then somehow examined three subjects over a week to say that the vaccine is highly effective. It's the opposite there. The form is maintained, the surface is super clean, but there's nothing underneath. Just to say that. I think that's very important. We see that plagiarism often has to serve as the last resort when no other accusation comes to mind. On the other hand, and perhaps this should somehow be considered in the principle of proportionality, when you look at the political sphere, let's say the Pfizer vaccine scandal, the procurement of vaccines, or Pfizer, such a toll charge scandal, where where a minister signs the contract against better knowledge even though the ECJ ruling is not yet available. And all these things where I don't even want to mention Cumex, where at least significant suspicions of corruption can be asserted, which are not prosecuted, or where there is also no investigative committee. Therefore, it would also be interesting research for sociologists, for historians, basically, on which accusations a society reacts and which not. Auf welche Anwürfe eine Gesellschaft reagiert und auf welche nicht? Also welche, was ist sozusagen ein... So, what is essentially an accusation where a society, 
a republic says, oh, wait a minute, there is fraud and so on, but we're not going to pursue it. But there are a few minor careless mistakes, and those need to be pursued vigorously. So there is a disproportionality present. It's palpable. That would be the first point. And the second, as mentioned, that the accusation of plagiarism is about the last thing that a society, also interesting for sociologists, can no longer bring up other accusations. So tax evasion is almost a minor offense. I mean, cheating on one's wife is also a minor offense today. Taking drugs as well. So with what do you want to get rid of someone you find undesirable? And plagiarism somehow still has an impact. Act. So I find that interesting. Also, we would have to address what we are going to do with ChatGPT. So if we are now, so to speak, there was this case in Japan where some literary Nobel Prize or some, some Japanese literary prize where the author said she had written 5% of her novel with chat GPT. She even admitted it during the award ceremony. So in that sense, the question is how we are going to deal with the concept of intellectual property and these accusations of plagiarism in the times of chat GPT soon. Exactly. I will later show an article during the production that was shown to me yesterday by my scientific friends, which presents a published paper in a peer-reviewed journal. The introduction begins with, sure, here is a possible introduction. That is a GPT introduction in a peer-reviewed journal that was published. Yes, exactly. But I... Journal. Now, we come to your actual question. How do we deal with the fact that we are now seeing and analyzing this in various directions? Because so far we have tried to contextualize it. And actually we have given society a few things to think about. How do you want to deal with plagiarism, with plagiarism hunters, with disproportions in evaluations, and so on? And your question also, with a view to the Harvard professor, you asked me how to deal with it when you feel that in a country that formally guarantees freedom of speech and also considers it a high good as a fundamental right in the protected eternity clause of the basic law, you still feel that this is not happening. What is the personal pressure, whether one still dares to speak out? And the most honest answer I can give is, I would not have expected it to turn out this way. I simply had, if I may say so, a really great, I had and actually still have, which is why I am now really looking forward to the court date on April 24th. I have great trust in this republic, and I hope that the presumption of the rule of law holds. Because if that is no longer the case, then we really have to ask ourselves what science is today. So the question is indeed on the table. That means if we had to trace this through various cases, you now mentioned the work of professors, there could be many other cases found of cancel culture. Yes, also Ms. Schroeder with her books on Islam. If we had to trace this through various cases, including the gender debate, woman and man, who is still allowed to say that? Who then gets expelled from the university? So there are indeed many relevant cases, also in various disciplines. Yes, biology, Islamic studies, European studies. Then it would actually mean that one can no longer think differently, so that we are being deprived of the opportunity to look at things from another side. Even if it's just to then say, okay, my perspective was the wrong one, I agree with you, but that the other side is at least put on the table again. The other side must be heard. Yes, it's that famous Latin saying that science is a discourse that can only work if one says A and another says B, and then we somehow come to C, to a synthesis. So, dominant opinion, minority opinion, and so on and so forth. If that is taken away from us, and that would indeed be the conclusion, that the possibility to shed a different light on things is increasingly being taken away through this limitation. And this happens through mechanisms that become autonomous. One mechanism is certainly third-party funding, meaning that you only write in the application what you know is desired, then it gets funded, and what is not desired does not get funded. This is also a form of subtle censorship, 
basically, so you already know beforehand that you won't get through with it. If I want money, I better write it that way. The second thing is actually algorithms, which, when they drive such a search engine and then build their literature course, then the search engine already filters out everything critical, so to speak. This means we apparently have processes that reinforce what was called la pensée unique in the 90s, that is uniform thinking, the consensus thinking. And I think beyond the case of Jiro, let's say this is a case for society. It really is a question to society whether it wants this. 